So uh, basically what we're going to try and tell you today is that one of the major causes of sarcopenia is in fact diabetes and it starts at a young age in people, it leads to both sarcopenia and frailty and if you are in an industry and you want a disease, diabetes is a very good disease to look at sarcopenia because basically they have a lot of sarcopenia. So to start with, just to point out here, this is from uh, our uh, African and middle-aged African-American study in St. Louis with Doug Miller and Ted Malstrom, and we'll be showing a number of these studies. And what we're really showing here is that basically, if you are fundamentally a middle-aged uh, African-American diabetic, you're more likely to die over a nine-year follow-up, and you're more likely to develop disability. And the functional effects, as you can see here, are you're more likely to have uh, poor activities of daily living, poor IADLs if you're diabetic, a worse SPPB performance, uh, you're going to have uh, a poor one-leg stand, poor grip strength. So diabetics develop early disability. This is another example, and I think Dr. Sinclair will spend more time on the slide, but this is just Greg's slide showing you that basically diabetes is associated with disability far more than you would expect in the community. Alan Sinclair many years ago did this phenomenal study for I think those of us who are geriatricians, where he actually asked questions about fundamentally activities of daily living that are important to everybody. So he asked diabetics, could you read? They were two times worse. Could they garden? They were worse. Could they write letters? Uh, they, diabetics were worse. Could they go out? They were worse. Could they use the telephone? They were worse. So I think this is a great example of what you should be looking at when you're trying to work out whether or not you're making an impact on a population. These are huge impacts you can make. So basically, as I think many of you know, uh, Dr. Seuss wrote this wonderful poem, which I'm not going to go through in detail except to point out that as you get older, I cannot see, I cannot pee, I cannot chew, I cannot scream. Oh my God, what can I do? My memory shrinks, my hearing stinks. No sense of smell, I look like hell. My mood is bad, can you tell? My body's drooping, have trouble pooping. The golden years have come at last. The golden years can kiss my whatever. And so fundamentally, that gives you some idea of what frailty is about. Uh, and as you all know in this meeting, frailty starts at around about 30 years of age, as you can see, so as you can see there, and we go down at roughly 1% per year towards that frailty threshold. And if you exercise, as Marco just showed us, that will slow it down. On the other hand, if you get diseases, it will speed it up. And you all know Linda Fried's uh, frailty definition, just to show you that again. And as most of you, I would hope, know that there's a simple version of this, which is the frail, and I'm going to talk about this in some detail with the diabetic, just to point out that you ask people, are you frail? Uh, can you climb one flight of stairs? That's resistance, aerobic, walk a block. Do you have more than five illnesses, or have you lost more than 5% of weight? And there are now eight validations showing that this works about as well as measuring things. You know? And my idea as a clinician is I don't have time to measure things, so fundamentally I like to be able to spend 10, 15 seconds on something per a person can answer. And some, uh, about two years ago now, uh, Ted and I uh, went ahead and we took ADLs out. And what we showed is if you compare all the definitions fundamentally uh, that are the physical phenotype, the frail works about as well as the physical phenotype, excluding ADLs. Frailty, you have to exclude ADLs because the whole idea of frailty is it is the precursor of ADLs. And there are very few studies on frailty that don't include ADLs. When you include ADLs, you lose your value to a large extent. So the International Association of Geriatrics and Gerontology recommended for the purposes of optimally managing individuals with physical frailty, we should be screening all persons over the age of 70 and that it can be prevented by treatment with exercise, as Marco has just shown you, protein calorie supplementation, vitamin D and reduction of polypharmacy. So what about diabetics? And what the slide, I'm oh, sorry, every time I touch this, it gets me into trouble. So fundamentally, if you look at the slide here, what you see is that 
Frailty is relatively common in all the studies that have been done in diabetics. So you see an increase in frailty in diabetics, and this is in our African-American study, and this is showing you the same thing again. If you look there, the robust pre-frail frail, and this is using our frail criteria. On the other side, you're looking at the CHS, the free criteria, and you can see that diabetics are more likely to be free frail than more likely to be frail. And when we look at function in diabetics, those who are frail are more likely to have ADL disabilities, IADL disabilities, one leg stand and grip strength. They're also more likely to fall, and they're more likely over the nine years that we have studied this population to be deceased. Uh, so now we turn to sarcopenia, which is the other part of diabetes, and this is my favorite slide of sarcopenia. I like to show this slide because it tells you everything you need to know. You see the old people coming along there, they get to the uh, swimming pool, they have to exercise. They swim across the swimming pool and they come out on the other side young again. That's what you need to know. If you don't want to be frail, you've got to exercise. If you don't exercise, you're going to be frail. So I could stop then. This is true for diabetics. It's true for everybody. So here we're just looking at uh, basically the list of different studies uh, that have been done to define sarcopenia, and we'll talk a little bit about those as we go forward. Remember that in basically diabetics, there is a decrease in type 1 fibers and an increase in type 2 fibers. And here we're looking and saying, here's one of the first uh, studies on strength. This is looking at quadriceps strength, power, and gait speed in the N. Haynes study. And what you can see there is that diabetics actually are, have an inverse association with strength and power compared to non-diabetics in a similar population. Here's a study on appendicular muscle mass per height, suggesting that at least in men, diabetics lose muscle mass. And here's one showing that accelerated loss of appendicular skeletal muscle mass occurs over six years. This is the study from Jean Wu and her group in Hong Kong, showing appendicular lean mass loss in men with diabetes was twice that of men without diabetics, and that in women, it was 1.8 times those without diabetics. Uh, this was over a four-year study. So again, loss of muscle mass is rapid and more rapid in diabetics than non-diabetics. He has another study showing excessive loss of muscle mass. And there's a correlation between the height of glucose levels and the amount of muscle mass that you are losing. Uh, patients with type 2 diabetes show a greater decline in muscle mass strength and functional capacity with aging, again, different from everybody else. And here, when we're looking at the participants with diabetes, they are slower walkers. So there are many reasons why diabetics should be slower walkers. Remember, it's not just the loss of muscle mass, but it is also the fact that they often have peripheral neuropathy, they have a variety of deformities, and also they don't think quite as well. So if you put all of that together, it's not surprising. Here, I'm looking at another study. These are, this is a six-minute walk at the top where you see those who have peripheral neuropathy manage 477 meters as a mean, those with diabetes 486, and the healthy controls, i.e. everybody else who didn't have diabetes 688. So again, suggesting that diabetics have trouble. So as all of you know, I think in this audience, that it's now recognized that the facts questions, those six questions for the fact, work almost as well as measuring a bone mineral density. So at the NIH conference it, uh, about two, three years ago that Stephanie Sudensky and Luigi Ferrucci put on, it was suggested that if this works nicely uh, for people who got bone mineral density and you don't really need to measure bone mineral density, why are we wasting our time measuring muscle mass and muscle strength? Because clearly we can at least see this, so surely we can ask some questions and see if it works. And out of that we developed 
basically the salt air, which is strength, how much difficulty you have uh, in lifting or carrying 10 pounds, assistance in walking, rise from a chair, climb chair, stairs, and fall. And this is uh, from our St. Louis African American study. And what we showed you, and I'm showing the validations here because it's in their interest, but mostly they have not been published, so you can't see them. We showed a validity in the uh, African American study in the Baltimore Longitudinal Study with Luigi Ferrucci. We showed it associated with ADLs, IADLs, grip strength, and mortality. And uh, we showed in the SOC, uh, in the NHANE study similar sorts of validations. Uh, in Chengdu, uh, we showed, and I always like to think we showed this in the pandas that come from Chengdu, but it wasn't in the pandas. It was the human beings there, okay? and in the human beings, we again, Barong Dong and uh, her colleagues showed a correlation with the SOC F, and then Jean Wu presented earlier today that the SOC F works about as well as all those wonderful definitions that we have. Uh, so fundamentally the question is, why would we bother to measure things if you could just ask questions and get about the same outcome? And uh, none of these are perfect. So the bottom line from Jean's talk, if you went to it earlier today, is that all the things we've got predict relatively well. They're not really different from one another, but they're not overwhelmingly good either. So we need a better definition. And the reason I showed you that validation is we're looking now at the sarcopenia in diabetics using SARC-F, and you can see here that diabetics fundamentally were much more likely to be SARC-F positive. That's the second one there. The first one over there is using the SCWD definition for sarcopenia. Diabetics were more likely to be sarcopenic. And then if you look at grip strength, uh, lean mass, and six-minute walking in our population, they equally didn't do that well. And here you see the differences in six-minute walking. Um, so the question then is, we're looking at community. What happens if you're actually a diabetologist, which in one of my roles I actually have to look after diabetic patients, and I run uh, the large endocrine program at our, our school. And so we had a medical student who got the MedStar Award, uh, which is an NIA uh, award, and he had his summer to do this. So we said, go in and ask the frail and sock F questions and see what percentage of people in our endocrine diabetic clinics who have got diabetes are frail or have sarcopenia. And uh, my endocrine colleagues all laughed and said, why are you doing this? We all know that these people are all fine. And so he went ahead and did it. And I only want you to look at the first column. Those are the people aged 50 to 59. And it turns out that basically the percentage who are pre-frail is 42% and 39% are frail aged 50 to 60 in a diabetic clinic. Uh, my endocrine colleagues said this can't be true, so we looked at sarcopenia, and basically 22% were sarcopenic, uh, and I might have got those other figures wrong, it's 39 and 18, it slipped down one. And then the other thing is that about 20% of the 50 to 60 people are cognitively impaired. Please remember, diabetes is a condition where you have to understand how to do a number of different things to treat yourself. And my colleagues who are diabetic are quite happy to send people home telling them what to do without knowing they're cognitively impaired. So diabetes is one of the high areas of cognitive frailty as well as frailty and sarcopenia. This just shows that the high correlations are between frailty and about 75% of the frail people are sarcopenic. Much lower numbers in overlap with cognition and large numbers of overlap with ADLs and IADLs. So to sort of bring this all together, why do diabetics actually develop sarcopenia and then frailty? And it's got a lot to do with insulin resistance. If you have insulin resistance, you're going to have decreased protein synthesis and increased degradation. You're going to have, very importantly, decreased capillary blood flow. When we exercise, we open up our muscle capillaries. When you do that, you open up tons of insulin receptors. 
So if you're not exercising, you've got all these insulin receptors that never see insulin and therefore you become insulin resistant. A huge part of insulin resistance has nothing to do with the receptor. It has to do with the failure of insulin to be able to get to the receptors that would be available if you're opening them up. Obviously, they get peripheral vascular disease. They have mitochondrial dysfunction with hyperglycemia. They have advanced glycation end products. These lead to oxidative damage. Diabetics have increased myostatin. They have uh, cytokine excess. They tend mainly to have, uh, males have testosterone deficiency. They have their neuropathy with a decreased neurotrophin 3. And they have increased fat accumulation, which leads them to having the sarcopenic obese. So this is the diabetic sarcopenia, a complex area with multiple things going on. And this is just showing you that the same sort of thing going on in the mitochondria, diabetics accumulate triglycerides, and that accumulation of triglycerides is not adequately handled by the mitochondria. There is a decrease in energy production. And how do you fix all of this? Well, um, I think Marco just showed us previously, but I can show you again. This is a diabetic look-ahead study, and what worked was lifestyle. Lifestyle was predominantly exercise, and interestingly, the older diabetics did better with exercise than the others. So fundamentally, the bottom line is exercise fixes all those things I showed you, and virtually it does fix every single one of them. So that's where we should be looking. So to conclude this part, uh, diabetics are more likely to be frail than non-diabetics, and this occurs at a younger age. Frailty in diabetics is associated with accelerated functional deterioration. Diabetics lose muscle and muscle strength and have a high likelihood to have sarcopenia. And if you want to do this quickly in the clinic, you can use the SARCF and FRAIL, which are useful rapid screening uh, tools in diabetics. And we're not going to take questions till the end, so Alan Sinclair is now going to come up and tell you more about disability in diabetics and how important it is. Alan, 